Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sadler's Wells on World Ballet Day for a discussion about female choreographers and the issues that face them and have faced them. My name's Graham Watts. I'm a dance writer and critic, and it's my great pleasure to facilitate this discussion on behalf of Birmingham Royal Ballet. And I'm joined here tonight by three choreographers, and I'll introduce them in turn. On my far left is Stina Quagaber, uh, who is associate uh, choreographer at English National Ballet. And Stina retired from dancing just a fortnight ago in Paris. It was my uh, great uh, pleasure to be there and see her farewell performance. And in the center is Olive Hardy. Olive is a young associate here at Sadler's Wells, and her work premiered on the main stage just a week or so ago. And uh, next to me is Morgan Runnicker Temple, whose work Hotel is going to be performed here at Sadler's Wells this evening. And Morgan is also one half of the filmmaking duo, uh, Jess and Morgs. Um, so I'm going to start off, actually, by going back in the opposite direction and asking each of you just to describe briefly your pathway into choreography. Um, so I, when I was probably about six or seven, um, my mum encouraged me to enter a choreography competition <laughs> and I did, I remember so clearly I did a solo to the Dance of the Nights, <laughs> so kind of started off something quite dramatic, um, and yeah, so my mum really <laughs> kind of had the idea and then, uh, and then probably, and then uh, primary school as well I had an amazing dance teacher who uh, we had amazing dance lessons and made loads of steps up together um, and then later on when I, I went to Central School of Ballet and I started choreographing there um, and was given some opportunities to make work there and then after I graduated uh, I sent off for like a choreographic workshop for this um, ballet company called Ballet Island, which is a small company still running in Ireland, who I still work for. And they asked me to go and make a piece, and I made like a 15 minute piece from the other dancers. And then they invited me back like year after year. And it's just kind of built up over like the last 15 years, really. So it's been quite a long. <laughs> it's been a long journey. Yeah. Um, and Olive, you're kind of at the beginning of that journey as a young associate here at Sadler's Wells. And tell us about how you came from, you were studied at Larbon and then at London Contemporary Dance School. How have you got into where you are now here at Sadler's Wells? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I started making when I was in training. So I think I've made my first piece of work in my first year at Larbon and then made my second piece. Yeah, little bits and bobs during the years and then when I graduated, I had this opportunity to become a young associate here at Sadler's Wells. Um, so that's really been uh, my sort of like pathway into it. Um, and over the last couple of years, I've just been developing my practice and yeah, very early stages of my career, which is really exciting. Thank you. And Stina, how about you? I think for me, it all started at first wanting to be a kind of ballerina or the swan in Swan Lake I was it was on Christmas Day and I think it was I was only three years old and I was watching Swan Lake and I watched the whole thing the whole two and a half hours and now from that point I was always dancing and quite early on I was just intrigued in creating my own pieces I would improvise the music as a little girl be super creative um, and my parents would take me to see uh, more of the contemporary works in Brussels like Matzek and Beja so it also gave me that, not just ballet, but it gave me that kind of, you know, in contemporary worlds, anything is possible. You know, there's this, you know, the creativity in it and, and that kind of got, you know, my mind going. And um, so I'd, I'd kind of have whole ballets in my head and create the sets and <laughs> costumes. And, and so, yeah, that's kind of developed on in my training. I was fascinated about always taking up every opportunity, developing my work, developing my practice and joining the company and continuing that on. And as you say, it's a whole, it's a learning curve. It's a journey. You discover what, you know, what your voice in as a choreographic language as well. You gave up dancing two weeks ago and you're still at the top of your dance uh, abilities. I, I think, well, I saw your performance. You were wonderful. Well, it must've been a really tough decision to give up dancing, to concentrate on choreography. Was it not possible to, to keep the two going in parallel? Yeah, I think I wanted to keep it going for as long as possible. I think as a dancer to embody 
uh, works by other choreographers has helped me um, as a choreographer. But I think it gets to a point where being at that top level in classical ballet is it's just so demanding on the body, but on a daily practice. And I, I'm so fascinated to explore more choreographic work and my, the language in it. And I love researching so much before I even start a work. And I, and I think it's time to be able to do that. And uh, there was also this like nagging voice in my head going, oh, you've got to keep in shape, got to keep training. So um, I'm excited for the next chapter. Now, for any aspiring uh, female choreographer watching this, it would seem that the three of you are all now established. I mean, each of you have got works performing in London either last week or in, in your case, Morgan tonight, in your case, Stina, last night and, and next week as well here at Sadler's Wells. So you, you're all pretty well established to one degree or another. But what have been the obstacles that you've had to confront uh, in getting to where you are today as a choreographer. Can I start with you, Stina, and I'll work, I'll work backwards along the line. Yeah, sure. Um, I think what's hard in, in the classical world is there are small opportunities. There's choreographic workshops. You know, companies have been good at kind of doing that yearly. And so they're on a very small scale. You know, maybe 200 people get to see them, 400. But it's it's there isn't much of that in between you know that middle stage you know so you a director really has to kind of give a trust in you and go right i'm gonna give you the big stage you know that step from doing small work to doing a triple bill at saddle as well is you know or f for a major company is a big step and you kind of need you know a director needs to kind of just kind of go with it and, and give you that opportunity and i was lucky that tamara did um and I think that's tricky. I think for me, I felt like as a female choreographer, I had to prove myself a lot, a lot more I felt than, than male colleagues at the time, especially going back maybe like 10 years. I felt that they maybe had um, more of a trust or maybe they saw the potential and they gave them more opportunities. Um, so I definitely felt like, you know, I almost gave up really. I think Tamara really, came and gave me that final kind of push that I really needed. Um, so that's kind of my journey in, in that. And Olive, I, I want to just um, uh, focus a bit on how you've made it from, you know, all of these young uh, students coming out of places like Larvin and Northern and London Contemporary, and here you are now as a young associate. Um, what, what were the issues and obstacles that you faced and how have you managed to kind of clear that hurdle and get to where you are? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, it's a tricky question because I don't think I've had any like, can't say that I feel like I've had direct obstacles in terms of like being a woman as a choreographer, but I mean, a woman in general, like living in the society that we do, there are challenges. Um, yeah, men take up a lot of space and their voices are heard a lot more. So it's, it's a balance of trying to, yeah, push past that and, um, yeah, allow the voices that I want to have to be heard too. Um, but yeah, I'm sure I'll face like a lot more obstacles as I sort of like go into my career now. Um, I think like, yeah, being an older woman or like having kids are going to be challenges. Um, financial stability uh, is something that is going to be a challenge um, just as an independent artist in general. But I don't know, I think men in general are more likely to ask for a pay rise, for example. So there are like lots of things, I think we're socialized as female to be an obstacle in any career. And, and Morgan, you, you described the long journey, journey earlier. Have, have you, you had the same frustrations that Stina described, the same moments of thinking, well, it's not worth it, I might give up in, during that long, long period? Um, yeah, definitely. And I think kind of uh, a sort of like mainstream recognition and, and feeling feeling sort of seen and, and taken seriously is, is, you know, I think it's, 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 to be honest, it's hard to know. Of course, I've had many, I've had many obstacles and many challenges in my career. And I've also had lots of, you know, fantastic experiences and felt really lifted up as well. It's hard to know, like, which of those are because I'm a woman. Um, I don't know what it would, I've never know what it would have been like had I been a man. So, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, I think, I think certainly, and I, and I think, you know, things have changed. I think sort of 10, 15 years ago, 
there just was so far fewer women's names being programmed you know it was completely acceptable for have to have a triple fill with no female choreographers in it like night after night which now is completely unacceptable but you know that that culture wasn't there 10 15 years ago i think you know for me i was extremely lucky because i started working in ballet island which is a, a small company and they were willing the director and ma was willing to take a risk again and again because you also have to make mistakes and you have to you have to have that space to make mistakes and come back and learn and like you know you can't be making it's hard to make those mistakes on a really big platform as well you want to make you know that to nurture and uh to nurture an artist is like an, another question i suppose but like it you know having been given large opportunities isn't necessarily always the way to but i think having lots of small ones also really help helped me develop um yeah but i i mean the challenges yeah are definitely there and i think you know as i have said you don't, you don't know what's going to come up and it's hard to know it's pinpoint i think for me as well because i was freelance so i was a freelance dancer and choreographer trying to kind of infiltrate these big institutions to make work on ballet dancers and and again i think i think that's slightly changed but i think 10 15 years ago like people would immediately say where have you danced and if you don't have like a decent ballet company in your if you haven't got a big ballet company on cv people are kind of like or if you haven't you know it's you even more it's kind of like people don't want to hear from you and i think i think those institutions opening up now obviously you know and and kind of broadening the horizons of the kind of artists that are invited to make work but i think that that that's another thing the kind of freelance sector and uh, particularly in the classical world how freelance choreographers are able to kind of uh make make work on that scale when I was preparing for, for this discussion, I, I revis revisited some articles I wrote for Dancing Times about uh, eight, ten years ago, and it was quite shocking, really, to read the issues that female choreographers, choreographers were facing then and see the data, the statistics. I mean, one statistic that jumped out at me was 56% of uh, dancers in professional ballet companies were women, but actually when it came to resident or associate choreographers uh, there was only one woman to every 15 men uh, you know it's a it's a you know a, a big gulf between being a, a dancer and being a choreographer do you, do you think things have changed i mean it's slightly shocking that we're still talking about it 10 15 years later have things changed a little bit for the better uh, or is it just you know a few choreographers like yourselves or Crystal Pite, Annabel Lopez Ochoa, uh, you know Kathy Mars, and they're just an exception that proves the rule? Okay, let me go to you first, Tina, for that. Yeah, um, we were talking a little bit earlier about. I think there is. I think it definitely has shifted. I mean, for sure, you know, it's not acceptable to you know program just triple bill after triple bill with with male choreographers. So there's definitely an awareness on it. So that's definitely a change, but. I think into nurturing, um, you know, the ballet world, there's, there's such strict discipline in your training that it doesn't almost nurture a real creativity amongst, you know, especially I would say the female um, dancers, there's point work, there's quarter ballet, there's just a lot of discipline involved and there's just a real craft to kind of get the technique to a standard and they're so focused on becoming a soloist or you know the solo or the next level up so we were kind of talking about things are changing because also ballet companies are doing more contemporary rep and so it, it's you know and even at schools you know improvisation was something we never did in a classical ballet but it's all part of you know finding your style of movement finding your own unique way of moving and that feeds into maybe you know being creative and wanting to choreograph yourself and so i th i think that still can go further i think that's still in the early stages and i think there's definitely more room for women to be more creative i think in ballet companies from the start rather than having this very strict kind of um discipline that kind of continues on um you know uh, i think we were morgan could i come to you on on that point you know uh, how, have things changed you find I mean obviously your career development has helped things change for you but do you think if you put yourself back to where you were 10 years ago and brought that forward to now would things be different I mean you know as you say like the fact statistically things have changed 
um, and the fact that we're having the conversation, you know, is brilliant. Um, I do think, I think that, I think that things have changed, but on the other hand, you know, not really enough. And if you look across the board in managerial positions, like as you stay, the statistics are still quite far, far away. So we can't think that it is all sort of sorted out, but yeah, I think that the kind of the question of like advocacy, like, as I say, I think it's great we're having this conversation, but it can't just also not that it is, but the responsibility can't be on the shoulders of female choreographers who are trying to get jobs themselves to be the people to have to advocate for female choreographers. Like it needs to be a question. Male choreographers can also talk about it and commissioners and people who have, because, you know, we're also not commissioning people, people who have like power to, to commission. I think the, the, the conversation has to, um, has to kind of open up beyond female choreographers themselves because in certain, you know, on, on a certain level as well, it, it's hard to, or it's not hard, but you know, you, to speak up is, is not nothing either. It's like that, that requires something to kind of say, this is difficult or, um, because you don't want to complain and you don't want to, you know, it's, it's just, yeah. So I think, I think kind of advocacy for female choreographers and for, you know, overall diversity of voices in that are being commissioned, um, the responsibility has to go kind of beyond the artists themselves and into mo management and it needs quotas and it needs kind of uh, concrete like steps, doesn't it? Which is happening. So in answer to your question, like I do think, I do think it's changing. I do. Yeah. I mean, one of the points that occurred to me in your story, sorry, Olive, I'm really talking to Stina and, and Morgan here, is that your big break, if you like, your, your opportunity came from a woman director you you at Valley Island and and with Tamara EMB I mean, do you think there's a problem in the female voice being heard by male gatekeepers who are in the main running companies do you think that's an issue yeah yes <laughs> that's a quite a straightforward answer um well it must be I don't know what, what, what else is that you know I don't think the argument that there are no female choreographers is any longer acceptable there are so um for some reason you know i mean i think let, let's be honest as well how many new commissions are there per year for a ballet company that it's, it's it's tight you know and and money's not endless and it's you know everybody's com uh, competing for a relatively small number of, of opportunities to make work um but uh yeah and i haven't done the data gathering but i guess if you listed the new commission certainly here in in the uk the proportion that are given to women is probably greater now than it was a few years ago but not that that means that the problem's cracked but stina what, what about you? Have, you have you got a point to raise on that yeah no i think you know it's also about you have to commission we all have to learn and you know we, we we can't just be you know these legends from the start you know you have to learn you have to you know create create works and it's it's you know you have to commission them you know it's not it's not gonna you don't create the best work as your first work you know it's it's a journey and and it's about supporting people you know um and just turning to you olive do you think enough encouragement and guidance and advice is given to young people at the beginning of their careers i mean coming out of places like london contemporary dance northern dance lab and you've got experience of two of those places anyway yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot changed. I mean, we went through the pandemic, so I think graduating during that time was particularly difficult. I know that for a lot of like colleagues during that time, a lot of people sort of questioned um, whether or not it was the right field to stay in due to the sort of like financial instability. And that is generally a problem. Like we live, I live in London and uh, we're going into an economic crisis. <laughs> like it's a really difficult place to live and yeah foreseeing a career in the arts isn't easy um yeah i have like two other jobs at the same time um which i love but um yeah i think there is a lot of support i think i seek a lot of support and there's a lot of people who are willing to support young artists if they if if you ask them um i have lots of mentors from lots of different sort of types of dance which um it gives me the encouragement and of course from my family and community um so yeah i do i do think that there is support there but um you need to pay the rent and you need to live 
<laughs> yeah, the financial issue is obviously a, a, a big one, and I'm sure it stops a lot of people from developing. I want to just focus for a moment on choreographic workshops, because if you're lucky enough to be in a company, um, then that is a way in to choreography. But a lot of uh, female dancers that I talk to are interested in choreography find that they don't necessarily have the time to actually focus. They're too busy in the corps de ballet, for example, to have the time to uh, to actually do prepare a work. And some that have shown talent sort of drop by the, the wayside. What do you think about choreographic workshops? I'll put the question to both of you again. And what can be done to bridge that gap to help more women make use of that opportunity? Yeah, I think for me, I mean, choreographic workshops, I'm a huge fan. I think they're so important, but also I think it's important to not make them too big and scary for people to have a go. You know, that first time for people to go, I want to try, but I don't want it to be already with costumes and lights and with 400 people and it's going to get reviewed. You know, I think it's really, it'd be amazing to have the platform and it doesn't happen in that many by companies actually to have the platform and have it on a smaller scale the problem is always time because there's so little time in companies now with so much rep but i think even if it's every other year for those people to have a go and to try um so i and also i think a lot of i know a few ballet companies who have asked people from outside you know sometimes they're not going to get a huge group of people choreographing within the company, but it's an opportunity for outside freelancers to step in and create with a ballet company. And I think, I think it's really important because those steps are needed f to kind of connect it and to open it up. Yeah. That opening up to freelancers is important for you, Olive, isn't it? Because you're not in a company, so you need that opportunity. Um, Morgan, what do you have to say about that? Or if anything to add to Spina? Um, no, I'm also a big fan of the choreographic workshop. I think, yeah, like having uh, a kind of slightly, yeah, more sort of informal environment to try choreography out is good. Um, and also um, kind of connecting, connecting with other choreographers in an environment that's like not really kind of, yeah, aiming towards the show. Um, I guess the question, in a way, it's, it's sort of like who, I don't know, I, from quite a young age, I was like, yeah, I quite could, could imagine the idea of being a choreographer, which I think is probably because of my mom and because like in my dance school, you know, there was like, fe it was the female teachers that were uh, making the shows that we did. And like, I did actually see a lot of female choreographers, you know, in these kind of smaller informal ways. Um, but I think that like maybe that choreographic, that the, the interest in choreography uh, isn't always like that for people. It's not always like a big calling. It's like something that they might, you know, kind of de develop or explore and it comes out. And I think that's something that's really important as well, that it's not like people, it isn't like I want to be a choreographer. Like it's this kind of, you know, like this big role that people, the shoes that people want to step into is it's, it's a skill, like another one and it's a tool and it's a kind of, it's a craft and something that's like not so I don't know do you know what I mean like uh, a big sort of daunting role because I feel like it's it's become like the role of a choreographer is this kind of uh, like lo big kind of I don't know title but actually maybe if it's more of a practice more people feel more Christina, you wanted to add something no, I, think. I was just saying it's a learning curve mm. yeah. isn't it you learn and I remember for a while I didn't think I call myself a choreographer you know at what point do you say I'm a choreographer like you know there isn't that suddenly like oh now this is it like so, you know so you had to work your way through a few pieces before you felt you you deserve the right to call yourself a choreographer that's interesting I would have called myself one after the first piece <laughs> well they that's you know something that yeah. Tamara's mentioned is that also we also want to maybe make sure we've got enough tools and, you know, we want to have the idea ready, you know, for that big commission that we we feel like we're ready and actually men just go, yeah, I'll have a go, <laughs> you know, that's also <laughs> definitely, you know, we want to be ready yeah. and we want to have ticked every box. It's yeah. yeah. And it's like, do I get a letter saying you are now a choreographer yeah. or like an email? Like, how do you know when it's happened? Or, or, a <laughs> or you, like, you know, but of course, like you still, you know, I'm, I'm still always like, I'm not, of course, you know, yeah that self-doubt and I mean I was intrigued by something you said earlier Stina about the fact that um men just kind of go for it and they they you know they, they're sort of picked up immediately if they show any potential 
they're sort of taken forward, whereas you felt as a woman you've got to kind of prove yourself again and again. I, that's actually also a theme that I remember women choreographers talking to me about when I was writing these pieces so long ago. So that hasn't changed by the sound of it. No, I think there is a shift within that. I think there's definitely a shift. I think they were just so used to having this image that the big choreographers were male. So there was this seeking out for the potential in in male younger male choreographers and and it, it was just it was just what they'd imagined, what they, you know, what was being set in rep. And, and I think that's just where it went. And I think that has shifted that's now. Shifted, yeah. That's, you know, yeah. really changed. Yeah. I mean, it's shocking how many dancers, actually Tamara Rocco said this to me when I interviewed her, have said that they went through their careers either without ever dancing a work made by a woman or it was, a you know, literally, you know, one or two over a long career. I mean, you couldn't dance in a major company now and still be able to say that, could you? I mean, almost every season you'd be dancing a work by a woman. Yeah, I mean, definitely in Shashna Ballet, but I know with, with all yeah. of them now, it's really, it's really changed. So in that sense, it's changed. I, I just want to go back to choreographic workshops for a moment before we lose the point. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, what we're saying is every company should run workshops and see it as an investment for the future. And those workshops really must be open, first of all, to outsiders to be able to come in as freelancers. And also, a certain amount of places really should be reserved for, for women. Would you, would you agree with that? I think so, definitely. I mean, I know for me, in my career early on, it was my highlight every year, planning what I was going to do in the choreographic workshop. And I think without having had that, I, I wouldn't have developed, I wouldn't have, you know, got the tools to do it, I wouldn't have learned, I wouldn't have created my own kind of vocabulary language and, and my kind of, you know, um, voice as choreographer. So I, for me, it's it's really important, especially because in, in ballet companies, there isn't much of that middle gap, you know, there is the big commissions and then there's the smaller projects. And I think there needs to be enough of smaller projects mm -hmm. To, to get you ready for the big works um, from outsiders to be able to come in and have an experience working with ballet companies. I, th I just think for to develop and nurture all of that, I think it's really important. And what about role mod models and, and mentors? I mean, do the three of you at the different stages now of your career, do you feel yourself as a role model to other female choreographers? Do you yourselves uh, have mentors or you've had mentors people you've looked up to people that you've followed or have given you advice how important is that let me start with you Morgan this time um I I found yeah um the support of people kind of within the industry like uh whether that's teachers or other choreographers or um directors of companies or friends or collaborators like so important like, to have that kind of community around you and there have been times where um that's all you've really had is the belief of like a couple of people that you've met up with and have been really like no that was good you know that was good keep going or that had that great moment or um I I, I definitely feel like that has been so vital for me I, um yeah I, I don't think I would have uh like sort of continued without that because especially as you're building and growing that's what you need you need a few people that, that basically believe in you I think on a kind of creative level or yeah and, and of course you work very closely with with Jessica your yeah. your collaborator so in a sense you've got a kind of inbuilt mentorship aren't you and I can't maybe I'm wrong but I can't really think of a an example of two male choreographers or creators working that closely I'm sure there are and people will think of them and probably write in with them but that that must be your sort of you know your your safety mechanism in a, in a sense is it yeah I mean Jess and I have made work together for like since we left central because we were the same year we trained together in the same year so we left when we left I don't know Long time ago. <laughs> like yeah 10 years ago 15 years ago probably and we just started making work really informally with like the old camera phones and when we were both just auditioning and unemployed and, <laughs> and you know I had nothing really so we've yeah our, our relationship and collaboration has kind of grown but then we've had gone on our separate journeys and she's danced for Wayne for years and years and and I've gone off and, and kind of done my thing but I think we've always like had, had that kind of co 
connection but for sure it's like it's other people believing in you is like so much and and sometimes it's like that's the most important thing isn't it somebody that you really respect them kind of saying giving you some encouragement actually it's like I've I found that um yeah how about you, Oliver? I know it's a bit early for you to be a role model, perhaps, but it, it would be great if you were. But what about mentorship? Have you had people that have really helped you in your in your journey to date as a as a young choreographer? Yeah, entirely. Like, yeah, numerous amounts of people um, of different ages, of different genders. Um, yeah, it kind of gives you this ability. Uh, soundboards. You kind of need an outside eye or someone to sort of like have a little fret to sometimes because <clears throat> it's yeah it's like a it's an up and down process sometimes um but yeah it's really really kept me going and I'm sure yeah I think that there are younger people from youth companies that I used to be involved in in Bristol um Rise Youth Dance and there are definitely younger people who I'm still in contact with who are now also training um so yeah there's there's a sort of longevity of of being mentored and mentoring and supporting and um, I think it's integral with something like the arts. Yeah. And and Stina, how about you? Yeah, similar. Um, I mean, the same, you know, in terms of the support, it's 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 so important. Um, Kerry Nichols was my mentor from 2013. And yeah, you know, we were saying it can be lonely at the front. You know, you have so many questions sometimes or you think I can't quite get it out of them. What What do I say? What do I do? And to have just somebody that you can ask questions to or they ask you questions and then you go oh okay and you solve them yourself you know it's just a somebody that you can really chat to and have that connection with and somebody that encourages you you know to just to keep going because yeah it's it can be hard so it's been it's been really important for me yeah yeah, yeah i'd also just like to add that just in terms of the choreography um sort of like workshops is also like being as like someone who's younger going into the studio and seeing other people working who are older in the industry, I think is really, really useful because then you see different ways of working, which then invite different possibilities for you to make. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say that that's useful. I find. Having like open, yeah, not such like closed processes as well, like watching other choreographers work. I guess that's quite a benefit of, you know, continuing to dance, isn't it? Because you get to be part of other choreographers processes, which was one of the things that, I really loved when I was still dancing but like even if you're what yeah if you're watching or observing like you learn so much don't you through that um it's wrong every program has their own process and also I mean my process changes depending on who you're creating on it's, mm. it's not always the same you know I mean uh, years ago, there there was a female choreographers uh, collective. I, I have no idea if it's still going, but I know that, for example, Avatara Ayuso, with her advancing women uh, uh, charity, has a sort of leadership program for for women. Do you, do you think those kind of collective, you know, getting women together to talk about these issues and and mentor each other and help each other is that a, is that a good thing? Is that something you yourselves participate in or would participate in? Yeah, I mean, I feel like we're participating in a conversation about it now. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's like that, that question of advocacy again, I think like it's it's a really positive thing to be involved in. And I do feel a responsibility for, you know, kind of playing a part in that. But I also think like it has to be, it can't just be on those people who, you know, can't just be on the, in this instance, female choreographers to do that. That has to be shared equally. And how about you two? Yeah, I think it, it we've, you know, the conversations that, yeah, I think you said those conversations suddenly were started in, was it 2012? Mm. Almost a long time that, you know, there's always this talk about female choreographers. And sometimes you do think, I hope I'm being chosen for my work, you know, and not because I'm female, you know. So I think there's time that, you know, yes, it's important to make, you know, the awareness, but it's definitely changing. And I think now, it, you know, it's nice to kind of also move on from it and, and you know, keep it rolling and keep it going yeah well i think we've come to the last question which i've deliberately held back to the end which i'm going to put to each of you in turn which is really what is the one thing or you know one or two things that the dance sector can actually do to make a difference for women choreographers um i mean it could be something we've already discussed or it might be something new you want to throw in so let me come to you first morgan on that commission women choreographers <laughs> That's short and sharp and sweet, yeah. Uh, Olive, how about you? Um, yeah. Mm. 
I mean, yeah, second that basically. Um, yeah, I think any sort of like minority group that isn't in a, in these sort of positions, um, seeing seeing other people in those positions allows and opens doors of possibility. But yeah, that's like the whole spectrum of gender from trans and non-binary people, and there isn't there isn't uh, yeah, there is like lots of space to be taken up by lots of different people. Um, and I just hope that. Yeah, not in real answer to the question, but I just hope that more people are able to be in those positions in order to allow space and possibility for them to come through. And Estina? Absolutely similar. I think commission the, the, the works and, um, and create the opportunities from the bottom down as well um, in companies, workshops and getting people from outside in. Yeah, I mean, I think from my point of view, it's a holistic thing, isn't it? We, we need to see more women generally in leadership roles. So that means more women as chairs of boards of companies, more women as chief executives, and more women as artistic directors. And then that might filter down to commissioning more female voices to be heard uh, on the stage. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank, you. thank you to the three of you for joining this discussion and making thank it you. so interesting. Uh, thank you to Birmingham Royal Ballet for facilitating this and to Sadler's Wells for hosting us. And most especially, thank you to all of you for watching either live or uh, on catch up. And if there are any aspiring female chore choreographers out there of whatever age, don't give up, uh, keep going because you know we need to hear your voices. So thank you everyone. <laughs>